coming up on our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide in 2021, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1137 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Nathan Symington has been confirmed as the newest member of the FCC. Meanwhile, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai has announced he is stepping down. We will have all the details. Australian radio amateurs have been denied access to the 60-meter band moving forward. December's transatlantic tests will mark the 99th anniversary of this annual event. The ARRL has announced a new editor of the National Contest Journal. We will tell you who it is. A former amateur operator from Illinois has been sentenced to prison over child porn. The FCC will now require valid email addresses on all applications. Iceland amateurs get access to some interesting allocations renewed. We will tell you where they are. A brand new solar observatory in Hawaii recently published its first images of sunspots. And a holiday special event is back for its third consecutive run this holiday season. We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will answer the question, this day and age, is the use of a RAM disk still practical? And he will break down the basics of 5G cellular technology. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will talk about two-meter reciprocity and other assumptions. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at amateur radio's role during the dawn of radio broadcasting. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will present his tower and antenna short topics list, things you should know before going up. And Bill Continelli, W2XOI, will be here with a special holiday reading of A Ham's Christmas. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Overcast and Gray, Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. It was the night before Christmas and all through two meters. Not a signal was keying up uh, any repeaters. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it feels like springtime even though it's Christmas, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, where we've decided to stay home this holiday season, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And from our soon-to-be-renovated studio, one of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And from snowy Fayetteville, Arkansas, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR, reporting. And now, with our lead story this week, here is Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Dave? Leading off our news headlines this week, on a 49-46 to 46 vote, the U.S. Senate on December 9th confirmed Nathan Symington to be a commissioner at the FCC. Symington previously served as a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Earlier, he was a legal associate at various law firms, often specializing in finance. Upon being sworn in, he will take the seat of Commissioner Michael O'Reilly, whose renomination was pulled by President Donald Trump last summer, shortly before it was to go to the Senate floor. Meanwhile, FCC Chairman Ijit Pai has announced that he intends to leave the commission on January 20, 2021, as the Biden administration comes into office. The FCC Chairman is appointed by the President. It has been the honor of a lifetime to serve at the Federal Communications Commission, including as chairman of the FCC over the past four years, Pai said. I am grateful to President Trump for giving me the opportunity to lead the agency in 2017, 
to President Obama for appointing me as the commissioner in 2012, and to Senate Majority Leader McConnell and the Senate for twice confirming me. To be the first Asian American to chair the FCC has been a particular privilege. As I often say, only in America. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai's departure will clear the way for President-elect Biden to either designate a new commissioner as chairman or select one of the two sitting Democrats already on the commission, Jessica Rosenworcel and Jeffrey Starks. Biden also could designate one of the two sitting Democrats as acting chairman to manage the FCC until his new pick has been confirmed by the Senate and sworn in. Until that happens, the FCC will have a two-to-two -two party split. The FCC has five members, typically three from the party in the White House. After considering several options for a 5 MHz amateur allocation, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the ACMA, has come down in favor of national government interests. Following a formal consultation, which would be a proceeding in FCC parlance, the ACMA has decided not to permit ham operation on the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more on this story from League Headquarters. After considering several options for a 5 MHz amateur allocation, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, has decided not to permit ham operation on the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band. The 15 kHz wide band was allocated to the amateur service on a secondary basis in 2017, but ACMA says unresolved sharing issues have prevented ham radio use of the band, already occupied by more than 500 other licensed services, as well as by the Australian military. Australia's IARU member society, the Wireless Institute of Australia, argued for amateur access to 5351.5 to 5365 kHz as a compromise. The WIA pointed out that more than 80 countries have been granted access to 60 meters. Radio amateurs in New Zealand lost access to 60 meters in late October. Use of the band there by radio amateurs was provisional as part of a trial. In the U.S., ARRL proposed amateur access to a new contiguous secondary band at 5 MHz in a 2017 petition for rulemaking. The FCC has yet to act on it. Options ranged from Australia-wide access to the whole band or part of the band to a segmented or channelized amateur allocation to no amateur access. ACMA decided that national defense and security use of the allocation were of high importance in determining maximum public benefit and decided on the last option. In balancing defense's existing use of the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band against the impacts of introducing use by the amateur service, the ACMA has decided not to support amateur use in the band, the agency said. Public and non-public submissions from the Department of Defense showed that expanding the use of the 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band to potentially several thousand amateur operators could impact important radio communications operations. The ACMA recognizes the high level of interest shown by the amateur community in adding this band and understands there will be disappointment. However, we are confident the decision is appropriate and consistent with the objects of the Radio Communications Act. In particular, this includes supporting defense and national interest objectives. Australia's International Amateur Radio Union member society, the Wireless Institute of Australia, argued for amateur access to 5351.5 to 5365 kHz as a compromise. A WIA survey showed most Australian radio amateurs preferred that choice. The Wireless Institute of Australia noted that because the band was agreed upon 
at World Radio Communication Conference 2015 on a shared secondary basis, as well as allowing low power, such as 15 watts EIRP operation, amateur radio operators in over 80 countries around the world have been granted access to the band, including many of our near-Pacific neighbors, New Zealand and Indonesia. Australian amateur operators therefore have a strong desire to be able to commence communications on this band with these countries, the WIA concluded. Two spot 5 MHz frequencies are allocated to the Wireless Institute Civil Emergency Network to provide emergency and safety communications. Radio amateurs in New Zealand lost access to 60 meters in late October. Use of this band by radio amateurs was provisional, allowing hams to use two frequencies in the band, 5353.0 kHz and 5362.0 kHz, as part of a trial. In the U.S., ARRL proposed amateur access to the band in a 2017 petition for rulemaking seeking a new contiguous secondary band at 5 MHz to the amateur radio service. ARRL also asked the Commission to retain shared access to four of the current five 60-meter channels. One would be within the new band, as well as the current operating rules, including the 100 watts PEP, effective radiated power limit. The federal government is the primary user of the 5 MHz spectrum. So-called interoperability frequencies in the band have been shared by amateur and federal government entities such as military auxiliary radio system during exercises and actual emergencies. Information on U.S. amateur access to 60 meters is available on the ARRL website. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. On December 11, 1921, radio history was made when the signal from amateur station 1BCG in Greenwich, Connecticut, was heard in Ardossan, Scotland, marking the first successful transatlantic radio transmission using shortwave frequencies. Taking a look back in history, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this story from ARRL headquarters. On December 11th, 1921, radio history was made when a signal from amateur station 1BCG in Greenwich, Connecticut, was heard in Ardrossan, Scotland, marking the first successful transatlantic radio transmission using shortwave frequencies. Between 1921 and 1924, radio amateurs experimented with transmitting across the Atlantic. Sponsored by ARRL, the transatlantic tests aimed to prove that shorter wavelength frequencies could propagate long distances using transmitters running less than a kilowatt. The initial run of the transatlantic test was a failure for the second transatlantic tests. ARRL dispatched receiver designer Paul Godley to Z to Europe to listen for participating stations. His nine-tube receiver employed the latest superheterodyne technology. In one of those historical coincidences, during his voyage to England, Godley met Harold Beveridge, who convinced Godley to use a specially designed, highly sensitive directional 1,300-foot antenna, still referred to as the Beveridge antenna. Over the course of the test period, more than two dozen stations were heard between 230 and 235 meters. That's roughly 1.3 megahertz in what now is the AM broadcast band. Some utilized spark gap transmitters. Others employed vacuum tube CW transmitters. The one heard most consistently was the 1BCG CW transmitter operated by six members of the Radio Club of America. During a pre-event dinner arranged by his British hosts, Godley also met wireless pioneer Guglielmo Marconi, who asked him to remind U.S. amateurs that, quote, I am too, but an amateur. As Rick referred to in his report, the one heard most consistently was a CW transmitter operated by six members of the Radio Club of America. They were Ernest Amy, 2VK, Edwin Armstrong, George Burkhard, 2SS, Minton Cronkite, 1BCG, 
John Grinnan, NJ2PZ, and Walker Inman, 2BGM. From 1BCG, they transmitted their message at 2152 UTC on December 11th of 1921. Number 1, DEBCG, W-12, or Words 12, New York. Date, 1-12-21. To Paul Godley, Ardrasan, Scotland. Hearty congratulations, Burkhard Inman, Grinnan, Armstrong, Amy Cronkite. Reporting on the accomplishment, ARRL Secretary Kenneth B. Warner, 1-EH, declared Excelsior. This designation test evolved to the contests. Inaugural contests included Field Day in 1934, the International Test in 1927, Sweepstakes in 1930, and ARRL DX Contest in 1932. Lee Finkel, KY7M of Phoenix, Arizona, will begin his tenure as editor of National Contest Journal with the magazine's January-February issue. Now an ARRL publication, the National Contest Journal is in its 48th year. Finkel, the 17th editor, takes over the reins from Scott Wright, K0MD, a noted and regular amateur radio contester who has helmed NCJ since January 2017. My hope is that I will be able to build on Scott Wright's hard work and that of my other predecessors, the very supportive AWR staff, and the impressive cadre of columnists and other writers to continue making NCJ a valuable resource for the contesting community, Finkel said. Most contesters will recognize his call sign from his regular contest activity. He's also been a contributing writer for NCJ and other publications. A retired lawyer, mediator, arbitrator, and educator, he and his family have lived in Arizona since 1981. Licensed as WN9EBT in 1962 in Chicago, Finkel said it wasn't long before he discovered contesting. His participation in the now-defunct ARRL Communications Department parties whetted his appetite for contesting. He also discovered DX contests and his still favorite CW sweepstakes. But it wasn't until after law school and a move to Phoenix that he got serious about contesting. After joining the Central Arizona DX Association, I was rubbing shoulders with some serious contesters, he said. That eventually led to operating as DX, initially as KP2A as part of a multi-multi contest operation, and later as part of the Voodoo Contest Group, when he operated for more exotic locales in West Africa, such as Togo, Mali, Niger, and Liberia. He has also operated on teams from the Galapagos, Caraco, Cyprus, and Suriname. I love being on the other side of the U.S. pileups, especially when our station is the only active station in a country, he said. This year, he had his first opportunity to operate from the DX side in the ARRL DX CW and Phone Contest at T17W and KH7M, respectively. Finkel is a member of the First Class CW Operators Club and CW Ops, past CADXA President, and a member of the Arizona Outlaws Contest Club. He serves on the Northern California DX Foundation Board of Directors. Finkel frequently operates the top band club of Arizona remote station NA7TB, originally built by Milt Jensen, N5IA. A former amateur radio operator and scout leader in Illinois who had helped more than 300 young men attain the rank of Eagle Scout over 40 years has been sentenced to prison for child pornography according to various news reports. A U.S. District Court judge ordered Milton Fosberg, 80, former K9QZI, to prison for six and a half years, a shorter sentence that the judge said takes into account his age and poor health. Fosberg pleaded guilty in August of this year. A report in the News Gazette said that Fosberg told the judge during a sentencing done via video that he was ashamed of himself. The prosecutor said police had also received tips about inappropriate behavior when he was scout leader, but he has not been criminally charged. The world's largest solar observatory, the National Science Foundation's Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope in Hawaii, has released its first image of a sunspot, capturing the phenomenon in striking detail. The image, taken last January, is among the first solar images of the new Solar Cycle 25. The telescope's 4-meter primary mirror will give the best views of the sun from Earth throughout the next solar cycle. The image was released along with the first of a series of Inouye-related articles featured in the Solar Physics Journal. As radio amateurs know, 
sunspots and other solar activity can affect HF radio propagation, among other things. And they are where the coronal mass ejections and solar flares originate. The Inouye telescope is in its final stages of construction. While the start of telescope operations has been slightly delayed due to the impacts of the global pandemic, this image represents an early preview of the unprecedented capabilities that the facility will bring to bear on our understanding of the sun, said David Baboltz, National Science Foundation Inouye Solar Telescope Program Director for the Inouye Solar Telescope. Solar cycle 25 is predicted to occur in mid-2025. With this solar cycle just beginning, we also enter the era of the Inouye Solar Telescope, said Matt Mountain, president of the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, the organization that manages the National Solar Observatory and the Inouye Solar Telescope. We can now point the world's most advanced solar telescope at the sun to capture and share incredibly detailed images and add to our scientific insights about the sun's activity. During the peak of solar cycle 24, 120 sunspots were tracked. Some 115 sunspots are predicted for the peak of solar cycle 25. The new image encompasses an area on the sun's surface of some 10,000 miles across. Just a tiny part of the sun, but large enough to fit Earth inside, the Inouye Solar Telescope said in its statement. The telescope is located on the island of Maui in Hawaii and is the largest optical solar telescope in the world. Construction began in 2013 and is slated to be fully completed in 2021. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. The UK communications regulator, Ofcom, is holding a public consultation on their spectrum management strategy for the 2020s. Amateur Radio is mentioned in Table 3 of the consultation document as one of the examples of sectors and wireless applications with specialised requirements. Ofcom said that the UK's airwaves, the Spectrum, are essential to enable the wireless services people and business use every day, from mobile phones to automated machinery, high-tech factories, and the systems that keep us safe as we travel and go about our daily lives. To support innovation, Ofcom wanted to make it easier for organisations to access the Spectrum they need for new and exciting uses. For example, this could include remote healthcare applications to support people taking medication and in the future, 3D holograms. Ofcom announced the publication of its Spectrum Management Strategy, setting out their long-term vision for how they propose to manage Spectrum in the future. To deliver this vision, they're proposing action in three main areas. Firstly, supporting wireless innovation. Ofcom plans to bolster its outreach work to help organisations looking at how they could improve the way they work by using Spectrum for wireless services. Ofcom also proposes to free up more Spectrum for pioneers, for people to develop new technologies and uses, for example, providing instant wireless connections between machinery. This follows Ofcom's decision to release 18.2 GHz of extremely high frequency Spectrum to help spur innovation. Secondly, licensing tailored to local and national needs. Ofcom says it wants to help a wider range of organisations access Spectrum to get wireless services off the ground by considering new options for localised Spectrum access. Local access licences allow organisations and services that don't need Spectrum across the whole UK, such as factories, airports and remote farms, to be able to get the airwaves they need to use wireless technology. And thirdly, promoting Spectrum sharing. Last summer, Ofcom opened up the airwaves, launching their Spectrum sharing framework, which meant organisations could access Spectrum that either wasn't being used or could be shared between multiple users. Ofcom says it wants to further encourage sharing in higher frequency bands and also introduce new sharing tools. Ofcom also wants to ensure systems protect themselves against the risk of undue interference by taking action to fit more users in and encouraging them to improve the systems they sell. Ofcom invites comments on its proposals by 5pm on the 26th of February 2021. 
You can view the whole consultation document by going to www.ofcom.org.uk and navigating to the Consultations and Statements section of the website. The deadline established by Brazil's communications regulator Anatel for the approval of old amateur radio equipment, which previously enjoyed exemption, is running out on December 31, 2020. At the end of May this year, Brazil's National Amateur Radio Society, LABRE, made Anatel a request for the approval period for this equipment to be extended, and the agency accepted the request, extending the term until December 31, 2020, through the publication of Act 2790 of May 22, 2020. Now, with less than 30 days until the end of this period, there is still a large number of colleagues who, having this equipment, have not regularized it. Anatel's system is very counterintuitive and has discouraged or even prevented this from being done. Thus, understanding that, in addition to this problem, the approval of this equipment by declaration of conformity is no different from what is done with equipment imported for personal use and that it should normally be offered without a deadline, Labra has filed a request with Anatel. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Executive Committee approved dues reductions and holidays for member societies in Region 2, which encompasses the Americas. With more details on the story, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Executive Committee has approved dues reductions and holidays for member societies in Region 2, the Americas. The action came as the committee held its fifth and final virtual meeting of the year on November 18th to complete outstanding business from its three October sessions and to approve the 2021 operating budget. Recognizing that the pandemic has created many hardships for member societies and all amateurs in the Americas, the Region 2 Executive Committee approved a one-year dues reduction for 2021. Member societies with annual dues lower than $150 will get a dues holiday next year, while larger societies will get a 50% dues reduction. The committee said it's able to allow the discounts because 2021 expenses are expected to be lower, primarily as travel restrictions have moved meeting attendance to being held virtually. The very popular IARU Region 2 workshops will be given a reboot in the new year, focusing more on the needs of member societies as well as on emergency communication. The other major item of business was to review the future committee's proposal to the IARU Administrative Council. The committee was formed to study and propose how IARU should be structured to become far more nimble and able to respond quickly to changes in the telecommunications ecosystem. The executive committee said, Representing Region 2 at the executive committee session were committee chair Ramon Santoyo, XC1KK, and secretary George Gorslein, VE3YV. The meeting concluded with a brief discussion on how much had changed in 2020, while noting that the pandemic had also created new opportunities. For example, the traditional in-person 2022 General Assembly to be held in Buenos Aires, Argentina, will now be a hybrid event with both in-person and virtual participation, removing the barrier of travel costs for smaller member societies to fully participate, the Executive Committee said. Here's the listing of upcoming AWRL Learning Network webinars. Check the AWRL webpage to register, to check for upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions. The following schedule is subject to change. HF, VHF, and UHF antennas for Summits on the Air, hosted by Brian Betts, W7JET. What antenna should you use for activations? We will discuss and show the different types of antennas used by activators and show the pros and cons of each type. The goal of the presentation is to help activators make a good, informed antenna choice that suits them best. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, December 15th, 2020, at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, or 1800 UTC. Learn and have fun with Morse Code, co-hosted by Howard Bernstein, WP2, UZE, and Jim Kreitz, W6JIM. Morse Code, or CW, is a popular ham radio operating mode. 
Learning CW does not have to be an arduous or lonely experience. Learn, practice, and enjoy CW with the methods used by the Long Island CW Club. This webinar is scheduled to be held on Thursday, December 17th, 2020 at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, 0100 UTC, Friday, December 18th. QSLing in an Online World, hosted by Anthony Usher, K8ZT. Learn all about the changing methods of QSLing in amateur radio, including traditional paper QSL cards and electronic QSLing, such as Logbook of the World and eQSL. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, January 5th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1800 UTC. Amateur Radio Logging, hosted by Anthony Lucher, K8ZT. Discover the advantages of keeping an electronic amateur radio log. Find out why you may need more than one software program for logging contesting, digital modes, special events, and so on. Learn about using one full-featured logging program to pull everything together, interface with outside databases, handle electronic QSLing, and more. The discussion will include file formats, importing and exporting data between programs, submitting contest logs online, and safe backup of data. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, January 14th, 2021 at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern, or 20.30 UTC. Visit the AWRL Learning Network, a members-only benefit, to register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. And now, an exclusive from This Week in Amateur Radio. In the spirit of the holidays, we present A Ham's Night Before Christmas. Yet another corruption of Clement Clark Moore's classic Christmas tale, this time distorted by Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, and the Raleigh Amateur Radio Society, Raleigh, North Carolina. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through two meters, not a signal was keying up any repeaters. The antennas reached up from the tower quite high to catch the weak signals that bounced from the sky. The children, Tech Pluses, took their HTs to bed and dreamed of the day they'd be extras instead. Mom put on her headphones, I plugged in the key, and we tuned 40 meters for that rare ZK3. When the meter was pegged by a signal with power, it smoked a small diode and I swear shook the tower. Mom yanked off her phones and with all she could muster, logged a spot of the signal on the DX packet cluster. While I ran to the window and peered up at the sky to see what could generate RF that high. It was way in the distance, but the moon made it gleam a flying sleigh with an eight-element beam, and a little old driver who looked slightly mean, so I thought for a moment that it might be Wayne Green. But no, it was Santa, the Santa of hams, on a mission this Christmas to clean up the bands. He circled the tower, then stopped in his track, and he slid down the coax right into the shack while Mom and I hid behind the stacks of CQ, the Santa of Hamming knew just what to do. He cleared off the shack desk of paper and parts and filled out all my late QSLs for a start. He ran copper braid, took a steel rod and pounded it into the earth till the station was grounded. He tightened loose fittings, resoldered connections, cranked down modulation, installed lightning protection, he neutralized tubes in my linear amp. Never worked right before. Now it works like a champ. A new low-pass filter cleaned up the TV. He corrected the settings in my TNC. He repaired the computer that would not compute, and he backed up the hard drive and got it to boot. Then he reached really deep in that bag that he brought, and he pulled out a big box. A new rig, I thought. 
a new Kenwood, an ICOM, a Yesu for me? If he thought I'd been bad, it might be QRP. Yes, the ultimate station. How could I deserve this? Could it be all those hours that I worked public service? He hooked it all up and in record time quickly worked 100 countries all down on 160. I should have been happy it was my call he sent, but the cards and the postage would cost two months rent. He made final adjustments and left a card by the key to Gary from Santa Claus, 73. Then he grabbed his HT, looked me straight in the eye, punched a code on the pad and was gone. No goodbye. I ran back to the station and the pileup was big, but a card from St. Nick would be worth my new rig. Oh, too late, for his final came over the air. It was copied all over, it was heard everywhere. The ham Santa exclaimed, what a ham might expect. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, good DX. The preceding was copyrighted 1996 by Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. Happy holidays. After years of planning and waiting, AMSAT Ireland has announced that its organization is complete and that it has become active and with the call sign EI2SAT. AMSAT Ireland is now seeking ham radio operators and other enthusiasts to become members. The organization is part of the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, or AMSAT, which was created in the United States in 1969 to support ham radio's involvement in space research and communications. The emergence of AMSAT Ireland comes as Ireland prepares for the launch of its first satellite, IRSAT-1, the Educational Irish Research Satellite-1. It is being designed by a team of students in the University College Dublin, and academic staff is designing the 2U CubeSat as part of the European Space Agency's Fly Your Satellite program. Interested hams are asked to visit the website at www.amset.ie. An inferno that raged recently at a major audio semiconductor factory in Japan is expected to have a stifling effect on the supply chain for both professional audio and upscale consumer audio components, including amateur radio equipment. The three-day blaze consumed the AKM factory over an 82-hour period in late October. By the time firefighters got it under control, the building was so damaged that operations had to be shut down. AKM is known for its DACs and ADCs, the digital-to-analog converter chips and analog-to-digital converter chips used in the music and film industries and in amateur radio equipment. Semi-Media, a news source for the semiconductor industry, reported that production of the chips is not likely to resume for at least six months, prompting companies reliant on AKM to anticipate being caught short. In November, however, AKM issued a statement saying it plans to work with cooperating manufacturers and will prepare to outsource its production of the chips. A report in Semi-Media noted that despite this, industry insiders said that the shortage will be difficult to solve in the short term, which will become the biggest chip supply difficulty encountered by the audio industry over the years. Amateur radio licensees and candidates will have to provide the FCC with an email address on applications effective sometime in mid-2021. If no email address is included, the FCC may dismiss the application as defective. The FCC is fully transitioning to electronic correspondence and will no longer print or provide wireless licensees with hard copy authorizations or registrations by mail. A report and order on completing the transition to electronic filing, licenses and authorizations in the wireless services in WT Docket 19-212 was adopted on September 16th. The new rules will go into effect six months after the publication in the Federal Register, which hasn't happened yet, but the FCC is already strongly encouraging applicants to provide an email address. 
When an email address is provided, licensees will receive an official electronic copy of their license when the application is granted. Under Section Part 97.21 of the new rules, a person holding a valid amateur radio license must apply to the FCC for a modification of the license grant as necessary to show the correct mailing and email address, licensee name, club name, license trustee name, or license custodian name. For a club or military recreation station, the application must be presented in document form to a club station call sign administrator who must submit the information to the FCC in an electronic batch file. Under the new section, 97.23, each license will have to show the grantee's correct name, mailing address, and email address. The email address must be an address where the grantee can receive electronic correspondence. The amended rule will state, Revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license may result when correspondence from the FCC is returned as undeliverable because the grantee failed to provide the correct email address. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. Hey, remember RAM discs? Are they still worth setting up? Next. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. A RAM disk is using a portion of your computer memory, you know, the 8 gigs or 16 gigs, or if you're lucky, 32 gigs, as a hard drive, as a disk. The idea being they're so fast to access that if you put something on there, it'd be really quick. And this was a technique very popular a few years ago. In fact, I remember going in to a computer store. This must have been 20 or 30 years ago. And hearing the tech say, explain to somebody, you know, what you really want is 8 megabytes megabytes of RAM in your computer. You want 2 megabytes for the operating system and programs, 2 megabytes for a RAM disk, 2 megabytes for a cache, and I can't remember what he thought the other two were for. But that's a long time ago, and I think it's probably the case that RAM disks these days are not worth the time and the effort. Let me let me explain why. Now these days we have a lot of har of uh, storage, a lot of RAM on our computers, pretty much eight megabytes. Goodness, we have eight gigabytes, and that's a starter. Uh, more typically, your computer will probably have 16 gigabytes or more. And it's not unreasonable to say, well, why don't I just take two gigabytes of that and make it a RAM disk? Now, first of all, you're going to need some third-party software. And yes, they still sell it. Uh, you know, $30, $40. You can get a program that will turn that extra memory into a hard drive. But then you're going to have to have the operating system use it as a hard drive. It won't be your C drive or your D drive. It'll be, you know, some other letter. You can assign letters in most of these programs. And uh, you can even have it, remember, it'll when you shut down the computer, it'll go away. So you can even have it automatically load on startup. I'm looking at a program called Data RAM, RAM Disk. Data RAM will load it on startup. It'll save the disk image. It's shut down, which is nice because remember, one problem with a RAM disk is RAM goes away when your computer's turned off. So any change you make to it won't normally be saved, but modern RAM disk software will save it. In fact, you can even have it save every few minutes if you plan to put anything on it. Typically, you wouldn't. Typically, you'd use RAM disk for something that's not going to change, something like a program that you load all the time. Here's why it's probably not a good idea. First of all, modern operating systems are really good at using memory to do exactly this. They'll load as much as they can into memory, and if you give them all the memory you've got available, they'll be smart enough to load that whole program into memory and run out of memory the whole time. There's no reason for you to manually say, well, okay, I'm going to give you 12 gigs, but I'm going to keep four gigs to myself and put the program there. It just isn't efficient, and you're not going to do as good a job as the operating system will. It knows a lot better what it needs. It's also a pain. It's expensive to get. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And the final reason it doesn't make a lot of sense is most computers these days have very fast disks. Solid state drives aren't as fast as RAM, but in most cases, they're fast enough that there's no real benefit to loading stuff out of RAM. So let the computer manage memory. It's going to do a better job. 
Get an SSD if you don't have one. That's what I would spend some money on. If you have an old slow spinning drive, get a solid state drive. That'll make the biggest difference and be the best bang for your buck. Given the trouble, the effort, and the cost of setting up a RAM disk, you're not going to see a whole lot of benefit. There are enterprise-level products that are very, very fast disk drives that are essentially just RAM memory backed up by... Uh, by power. They're very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars. And I honestly don't think those are worth it either. So your system, these days, modern operating systems do a really good job of managing memory, processor. Let them do their job. And you just enjoy the computing. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Good article in Ars Technica breaking down 5G. And I thought this would be good to pass it along because you're already seeing ads from companies won't name names, that 5G is already here in the NFL stadiums, 11 stadiums have 5G in one little corner over by the taco stand, that's it, uh, that some cities have 5G, well, if it's AT&T, it's not really 5G, it's 5GE, which is really just LTE, so there's a lot of, you know, you don't have a 5G phone, unless you're nuts, there are some 5G phones you can buy, not from Apple, but Samsung has one. One Plus has one, but they're really expensive. And the worst part is when you buy the phone, you're required to sign up for non-existent 5G service at a much higher price. Oh, and your battery life's going to be terrible. So I'm not recommending 5G at this point. But this article and uh, is by Rob Pegararo, and I thank you, Rob, for writing this because it's not long, but it kind of clarifies this whole confusing mess. He starts, the long-touted fifth generation, that's what 5G means, of wireless communications is not magic. <laughs> It'll be nice, but it it's really a, a, a basket of technologies, and that's part of the problem. It's, 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 you may hear some wonderful things, but that is about a particular kind of 5G. It's, he says, the first thing to know about 5G, it's a family affair, sometimes a dysfunctional family affair. Because there are three different wireless frequencies for 5G, and each of them works very differently. There's one, the one most people talk about, the one I usually talk about, millimeter wave 5G. It's at 24 gigahertz. Now, your Wi-Fi is at 2.4 gigahertz. 24 gigahertz. That's why it's millimeter wave. It's micro wave. And... You may know this. One of the reasons it's safe to use your microwave oven is because these very small uh, frequencies, like even 2.4 gigahertz, bounce off of things. A piece of paper, they will bounce off of. A leaf, they will bounce off of. So at 24 gigahertz, you have to be very close to the tower. The tower, they'll need four times the tower density for millimeter wave 5G. And line of sight, and it's not going to go through walls in probably won't even, you know, go through your windows at your office. However, <laughs> it's fast if you can get it. 1.2 gigabits, very low latency, 9, millise 9 to 12 milliseconds, very much like your landline internet if you had really good internet. That's line of sight, and it was 900 feet from the transmitter. <laughs> so you're, you're not, we're well, not, no one. Uh -uh. Maybe if you live in a very dense city and you happen to be close to the tower, maybe. And in fact, this will be used in areas like that for uh, home internet, I suspect. So that's that's one flavor and probably not the one you and I are going to get. Then there's the one T-Mobile already just launched at 600 megahertz, much, much longer frequencies. That travels great through walls and stuff, but it's not that much faster. Uh, Sprint, then there's, that's low band. Then there's mid band, which Sprint's launched uh, at 2.5 gigahertz. That's the same as LTE. That's the same as close to Wi-Fi. So lower f speed, but it'll travel better. And you'll probably get 100 megabits, which is pretty good. I mean, you'd everybody would be happy with that. Although I have to point out, I, you know, on a good day with a good carrier and not too congested a cell site, I get 100 megabits on my on Verizon. AT&T, some of these others, on, on LTE. So this is the problem. It's so, you see, I already I'm confused. There's three bands, millimeter wave, medium wave, and low band, as they call it. AT&T is starting to launch the low band. <laughs> oh, and another thing I might point out, they just did a study, I think it was, was it the 
the FCC government agency did a study of of carriers coverage maps you know those beautiful pink and red glowing maps that you see on their websites and said yeah not so much that's <laughs> i don't want to use the word lie but you might it's not exactly what you're going to get so don't look at the coverage maps and go honey let's get a 5g phone we're right smack dab in the middle you might not be in fact this whole thing is a, it's a bit off a bit of a ways off so i'm just going to mention that Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. On November 2, 1920, Warren G. Harding was elected President of the United States. Millions read the election results in the newspapers the next day. In the Pittsburgh area, however, hundreds heard the election returns the moment they were wired in. Thanks to Dr. Frank Conrad, a Westinghouse employee who broadcast the results over 8XK, his amateur station. This station would evolve into KDKA, and the night of November 2, 1920, has been called the start of the multi-billion dollar broadcast industry. But was it? Let's take a look at the evolution of broadcasting and the amateur's role in it. The idea of broadcasting was first considered by Lee DeForest in May 1902 when he wrote that, ultimately, wireless telephony will be possible. He urged the financial backers of the DeForest Wireless Telegraph Company to develop and patent the concept. The stockholders, however, were more interested in immediate profits through massive stock sales rather than genuine development and refused to finance the necessary research. Undaunted, DeForest in 1907 formed the DeForest Radio Telephone Company, in a statement that for 1907 must have appeared to be radical or even bizarre, but was amazingly prophetic, he wrote, I look forward to the day when opera may be brought into every home. Someday the news and even advertising will be sent out over the wireless telephone. Despite DeForest's intense interest in this area, he was not the first to broadcast the human voice and music over the airwaves. That honor belongs to Reginald Fessenden, a Canadian professor. He was the first to recognize the inherent flaw in the concept of spark transmissions and set out to find an alternative. His quest led him to Schenectady, New York, and the services of General Electric's most brilliant scientist, Charles Steinmetz. Fessenden explained his idea, an alternator capable of generating waves of 100,000 cycles per second or 3,000 meters. Steinmetz and his assistant, Ernst Alexanderson, worked for almost two years and finally produced an alternator that met Fessenden's requirements. The Alexanderson alternator, as it was now known, was delivered to Fessenden's station in the fall of 1906. On the evening of December 24, 1906, ship and amateur operators heard something in their headphones they had never heard before. Someone speaking. A woman singing. Someone reading a poem. Fessenden himself played the violin. Not to be outdone, DeForest continued his radio telephone experiments in the period of 1907 through 1910, broadcasting from the Eiffel Tower and live from the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, where Enrico Caruso was singing. However, all of these transmissions had one major problem. Without a pure, stable, direct, current CW carrier to modulate, all of the signals had a background whine and distortion. Real development in the area of modulated carriers would have to wait until Armstrong discovered the oscillating properties of a regenerative circuit. By 1916, both Armstrong's circuit and the Audion were widely circulating in the radio world and broadcasting surfaced again. Lee DeForest resumed his transmissions with programs of good music, culture, and lectures. DeForest can be credited with two firsts in 1916. The first advertisements for his Audion and other products, and the broadcast of the presidential election between Woodrow Wilson and Charles Evans Hughes. 
Unfortunately, DeForest signed off before the California results were in, so he declared Hughes the winner over Wilson. Also in 1916, amateur station 2ZK broadcast one hour of music each night. David Sarnoff, who had manned his station during the Titanic disaster, also got into the act. He wrote a memo to his employers at American Marconi suggesting a radio music box, which would become a household utility. He went on to describe his vision of radio broadcasting and then turned to finances. He predicted an income of $75 million a year from the sales of receivers. Marconi, still focusing on ship-to-shore telegraphy, took no action on the memo. After amateurs had returned to the air in November of 1919, hundreds of them began to explore the area of broadcasting. In May 1920, amateur station 8XK joined many other hams in the transmission of music. Incidentally, it was legal for amateurs to broadcast music, news, sports, lectures, advertisements, or indeed just about anything else they wanted. The Radio Act of 1912, still in effect, did not mention amateurs. Rather, one paragraph made a general reference to individual private or commercial stations. The only real restriction was the 1 kilowatt power limit and the 200 meter wavelength. After that, the government didn't care. Thus, those amateurs who had built equipment to modulate their CW transmitters eventually played a phonograph record or two, sang, or tried to sing, or broadcast some form of entertainment. With all of the above documented evidence, why is November 2, 1920 considered the start of broadcasting? The answer lies not at the transmitter, but at the receiver. Prior to that night, all broadcasts had, in effect, been from one amateur to another or to a commercial station. The November broadcast, though, was designed and promoted by Westinghouse as a transmission to the general public. Starting in September, stores were selling basic receivers for $10 to receive 8XK. Westinghouse, in effect, had seized DeForest and Sarnoff's idea and was marketing it to the general public. Thus, it was the makeup of the listening audience that defined the start of broadcasting. When the word of this successful transmission got out, more amateurs got into the act and set up their own little broadcast stations. By the end of 1921, it was estimated that about 1,200 amateurs had made at least one broadcast. Some had a regular schedule of programs and would evolve into commercial stations. Others did it just out of curiosity. But there were listeners. Over 400,000 people heard the Dempsey Carpenter fight on July 2, 1921. Radio sales were approaching 100,000 per year, not counting crystal sets, which were selling at the rate of 20,000 per month. However, with this explosive growth came two problems for the amateur. The first was an identity crisis. What should the role of the amateur be in broadcasting? Some thought that we should stay out of it and just stick to traffic handling on CW. Others envisioned the amateur as a jack-of-all-trades, expert CW operator and relay station, as well as community broadcaster. In fact, a new name evolved to describe this amateur broadcast hybrid, citizen radio or wireless. Even QST was confused. For a period of time in 1921, the word citizen replaced amateur on the front cover. The other problem was frequencies. Everyone, amateur, broadcaster, and hybrid, was on 200 meters. Tuning across the dial in 1921, one would hear mostly CW, a few spark holdouts, and the new broadcasters. While the amateurs were used to the interference, the general listening public was not. They had purchased their radios to hear music, not CW. Complaints started to pour into the Secretary of Commerce. Legally, he was powerless as the Radio Act of 1912 offered no solutions. A conference was called for all interested parties held in Washington in February 1922 to try to resolve the impending crisis. Even though he was exceeding his authority under the Radio Act, Secretary Hoover was able to get the following proposals accepted at the conference. 1. Henceforth, special broadcast licenses would be issued. Two frequencies would be available for broadcasters immediately. 360 meters, or 833 kilocycles, for regular transmissions, and 485 meters, or 619 kilocycles, for crop reports and weather forecasts. 2. After the marine interest had abandoned the 220 to 545 meter range, or 1,363 to 550 kilocycles, it would be turned over to broadcasting. 3. Broadcasting was forbidden by amateurs who were defined for the first time by name, 
as stations operating without pay or commercial gain merely for personal interest. 4. Quiet hours were imposed on all amateur stations effective from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. daily and on Sunday morning. The fact that the number of broadcasting stations dropped from 1,200 to 30 immediately after these regulations went into effect shows just how many amateurs were in fact pioneer broadcasters. This agreement, however, was a house of cards. Secretary Hoover had stretched his authority under the Radio Act of 1912 well past the breaking point. In 1926, the cards came tumbling down and the summer of anarchy was ushered in. How would amateurs fare with no enforceable regulations in place? Join us the next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives explores the events leading up to the creation of the Federal Radio Commission. This is Bill Cottonelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air, This Week in Amateur Radio. In a part of Oklahoma with a proud space legacy, a new generation is touching the sky, this time via amateur radio. There's been a nice bit of astronaut history going on for years in Tecumseh, Oklahoma, and perhaps no one knows that better right now than the students in the Tecumseh High School Amateur Radio Club, K5THS. On Friday, December 4th, they added themselves to that local history book when they spoke over amateur radio with ISS astronaut Shannon Walker, KD5DXB. The nine-minute Q&A happened over a two-meter station built by 20 ham radio operators. Teacher Bill Crow, K5LUO, led the group in its effort to get the station, with its beam and rotators, up and running. One by one, the students quickly stepped up to the microphone inside the school auditorium to deliver their questions to Shannon Walker, who this year became the first woman to fly inside a SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule. Here is what this Eris contact sounded like at the Tecumseh High School Amateur Radio Club. NAU1SS K5THS. K5THS, NA1SS, I have you loud and clear. Tell me. Okay, Shannon, thank you for doing this. And are you ready for some questions from the students? I am ready. Over. This is Keegan. If you could go back to high school, what is the one thing that you would pay more attention to? Over. Keegan, great question. I think I would pay more attention to history. I find the world is a wonderful place, but it's a very complex place. And I find that you can't understand where you're going and where you are without knowing where you have been. Over. I'm Dallas. What is the scariest part of traveling through the atmosphere? Over. Dallas, I think the scariest part is, is wondering if the engines are going to turn on safely at the right time. Over. I'm Tyler, KI5 LPA. Are you longing for the day of return to Earth or already putting on your brakes so you can stay on the ISS longer? Over. Tyler, I love it up here. I don't actually know when I'm coming back, but I'd, I'd be okay if I had to stay even longer. Over. I'm Riley. What is one skill that every astronaut should have before entering the astronaut program? Over. Riley, the one uh, skill that every astronaut needs to have is teamwork. you got to be able to work on a big team with all kinds of people. Over. Hi, Marys. Have you seen changes to your circadian rhythms or those of any plants or animals aboard the ISS? Over. Aries, you think we would would, but we actually don't. It's kind of like big, being in a big office building up here. Over. I'm Kaylee. How does NASA train you to deal with zero gravity? Over. Kaylee, NASA doesn't actually train us to deal with zero gravity. It's something that you really can't um, learn about until you actually are in zero gravity. Over. I'm Scotland. How do you get dressed without your clothes floating away? Over. It is, a, it is a difficult thing, because if you're not hanging on to your clothes, they will float away. So basically, you have to get out one item of clothes, put it on, and then get out the next item and put that on. Over. I'm Cambry. How does NASA prepare you for walking on Earth after months of being in space? Over. Cambry, lots of exercise. We've got trainers on the ground in Houston that work with us, and we spend a couple of hours every day doing exercise. Over. Hi, I'm Harrison asking for Bailey. Is there a sight in space that was breathtaking the first time you saw it and what was it? Over. Well, Bailey and Harrison, I think there's two things that really stand out. The first time I saw a sunset from space because the colors are so, so rich. And the other thing 
is when I saw the Milky Way. I know you can see a lot of stars in those wide open spaces of Oklahoma, but you can see even more from up here. Over. Hi, this is Harrison again. If there's a small space particle that penetrates the ISS, how is that handled? Over. Hey, Harrison, great question. First thing to know is that we've actually got shielding on the outside of the space station to keep us safe. But the other thing is we have emergency procedures on board that we practice all the time. So if we were penetrated and our atmosphere started leaking out, we've got oxygen masks and we would get into our spacecraft to come home. Over. This is Keegan again. What are some of your favorite experiments in which you are involved? Over. Hey, Keegan. Um, you know, I'm just getting into the scientific program up here, but I think some of my favorite ones are the ones that I am a test subject in the, uh, um, you know, learning about the human body. Over. This is Dallas again. How much training do you need before going into space? Over. Hey, Dallas. Uh, you actually need lots of training before you go into space. When you're selected as an astronaut, you are training for about two years before you are even eligible to go into space. And then for your particular flight, it's maybe another two years of training. Over. This is Tyler, KI5LPA. What happens if you become sick in space on an EVA or inside the ISS? Over. Five OPA. Um, you know, we are trained for medical emergencies up here, um, and so it depends on the how, how sick you might get. There's a lot of things that we can handle on board. We've got doctors on the ground that we can talk to, and if they are really serious, then we can get in our spacecraft and come home. Over. Hi, it's Riley again. What is the most challenging plant to try to grow in space? Over. Riley, that's an excellent question because, you know, we're just starting to learn about growing plants in space. Up here, we've grown some lettuces and some radishes, um, and we've got other things on the horizon, and I honestly don't know what the most challenging thing is yet. Over. This is Aries again. Does time change in space? Over. Aries, time does not change in space. A uh, minute's a minute, and a day's a day. Um, I think, no, nope, it's all the same up in space. Over. I'm Kayla. How do you sleep in space? Over. Kayla, it's a good question. We've got little crew quarters that we have uh, to sleep in, and inside our crew quarters we have a sleeping bag. And so we get inside our sleeping bag, which is attached to a wall, and we just float while we sleep. Over. Hi, this is Scotland again. How do you maintain body heat in and out of the ISS? Over. Scotland, yeah, it can be kind of complicated. Inside the space station, it's not too bad. It's like picking an office building, so we've got... Um, air conditioners that keep us warm and heaters that can, uh, our air conditioners that keep us cool and heaters that keep us warm. Outside, it's much more complicated because it can be a couple of hundred degrees in the sun and a couple of hundred uh, minus degrees in the shade. So you have to wear a spacesuit that can do all that air conditioning for you. Over. Hi, I'm Cambry. If someone gets injured, how do you respond? Over. Cambry, if someone gets injured, we depend on our medical training up here. Over. Hi, this is Harrison again asking for Bailey. If a free-floating one-ounce drop of water were to freeze to the ISS, would it be rough or smooth in shape? Over. Hey, Bailey and Harrison. I think this was an excellent question that we had to think a lot about. So if it's a free-floating drop of water, it's going to be uh, in a round spherical shape. But once it starts freezing and starts expanding, I don't actually know if it would stay um, at the round shape or if it would uh, uh, become all rough. I really don't know. We have not done that yet. Over. Hi, this is Harrison again. What are some personal items that you brought with you to the ISS? Over. Harrison, you know, we don't have a lot of space to bring up personal items, so this time I went the digital route. I brought up a bunch of pictures of my family and friends, and I have them as a, as a screensaver on my desktop, on, on, on my laptop that's in my crew quarters. Over. Hey, Shannon. This is uh, Mr. Crow, K5LUO with uh, K5THS. We really appreciate you doing this with Harris and NASA. And uh, we got some excited kids after all of this. Thank you very much. Well, it was definitely my pleasure. Over. NA1SS, K5THS. Signing clear. Making space history seems to be a natural for this part of Oklahoma. Gordon Cooper, one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, was a native of nearby Shawnee and attended Shawnee High School, where he played on the school's football team. Gordon Cooper Drive is named for the space pioneer, and it runs between Shawnee and Tecumseh. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. 
We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Friday, December 11th. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that solar activity quieted this week, with the average daily sunspot number declining from 57.6 to 28.9 and the daily average solar flux softening from 108.1 to 91.9. On December 8th to the 10th, the sunspot number was 11 on each day, which is the minimum non-zero sunspot number. Sunspot Group 2786 provided some great activity, but it is about to rotate off the sun's visible surface. But a look at stereo satellite images on Thursday night, December 10th, shows some magnetic complexity about to become geo-effective from the sun's southern hemisphere. This could mean more great conditions. The average daily planetary A index went from 6.4 to 4.4, and average daily middle latitude A indices went from 5.6 to 3.1. The predicted solar flux for the next 45 days is 82 on December 11th and 12th, 84 on December 13th and 14th, 80 on December 15th to the 18th, 92 on December 19th to the 24th, 94 on December 25th to the 28th, 96, 94, and 92 on December 29th, 30th, and 31st, respectively, 90 on January 1st to the 4th, and 88 on January 5th to the 7th. A coronal mass ejection occurred on December 7th and was expected to spark a geomagnetic storm on December 10th through the 11th, which is why the planetary A and Dice was predicted at 40, 25, 8, and 8 on December 10th through the 13th. This was revised to the forecast on December 10th. Minnesota Public Radio aired a story on what happened and how we missed the storm. Here's the AMSAT report. An amateur radio on the International Space Station Slow Scan TV event is scheduled from the International Space Station for late December to celebrate the 20th anniversary of ARIS. The event is set to begin on December 24th and continue through December 31st. Dates are subject to change. The frequency to listen on is 145.8 MHz. All you need to receive SSTV is a 2-meter transceiver and a small beam you can aim by hand, like an arrow. Take the audio from your radio's earphone jack and run it into the line-in or mic-in on your laptop. Several free programs are out there to decode SSTV images. Try MMSSTV or do a search for HAM SSTV software. You can simply record the audio and decode the images later using the SSTV software. The launch that will carry AMSAT's RAD FXSAT 2 FOX 1E CubeSat into orbit could come as early as this month. Virgin Orbit has announced that the launch window for its Launcher 1 Launch Demo 2 mission, which will carry the AMSAT spacecraft into orbit, opens on December 19th. FOX 1E is the final FOX 1 series satellite built by AMSAT. Like Rad FX Sat FOX 1B, now AMSAT Oscar 91, the FOX 1E CubeSat is a partnership opportunity between Vanderbilt University and AMSAT and will carry a similar radiation effects experiment studying new FinFET technology. The RAD FXSAT-2 spacecraft is built on the FOX-1 series template, but FOX-1E features a linear transponder upgrade to replace the standard FM voice transponder in the FOX-1A through FOX-1D series. In addition, the uplink and downlink bands are reversed from the previous FOX satellites in a mode VU or mode J configuration using two meters up and 70 centimeters down. The AMSAT report appears each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center reports that geomagnetic storm watches were in effect through December 11th due to the effects of a direct coronal mass ejection collision with the Earth's magnetosphere from December 9th until December 11th. The coronal mass ejection eruption was associated with a C7 solar flare erupting from sunspot region 2790 on December 7th. The Northern Lights put on a big show for the northern portion of the United States following a coronal mass ejections collision with the Earth's magnetosphere. 
Arrival of a shockwave associated with the CME occurred late on December 9th, initially resulting in a G1 geomagnetic storm. As CME effects continued, geomagnetic disturbances increased, especially where the magnetic field carried with the CME rotated to a southern orientation, causing magnetic reconnection with the Earth's opposite polarity magnetosphere. The potential for a stronger storm level exists, and a G3 or strong geomagnetic storm level watch was in effect for December 10th. A G3 storm level can result in intermittent HF radio conditions, with the possibility of aurora borealis appearing as far south as Illinois and Oregon. Coronal mass ejection-related geomagnetic disturbances were forecast to continue through December 11th, likely resulting in G2 or moderate geomagnetic storm levels. Another geomagnetic storm watch has been issued accordingly. In a G2 storm, HF radio propagation can fade at higher latitudes, and aurora has been seen as far south as New York and Idaho. You can visit the Space Weather Prediction Center current space weather conditions webpage for updates. News now of a forthcoming operation from the southerly tip of our globe. A Russian radio ham is currently on his way for a tour of duty in Antarctica and is planning to operate on the amateur bands in his spare time. Alexei Romeo X-Ray 6 Alpha will be active as Romeo India 01 Alpha November Tango from Antarctica between December the 25th, 2020 and May the 30th, 2021. Activity will be from the Russian Progress and Vostok base stations. Operations will be on 40 meters and higher using CW and FT8 QSL via his home call Romeo X-Ray 6 Alpha. And Alexei is currently operating as Romeo X-Ray 6 Alpha Maritime Mobile from on board the Russian scientific research icebreaker Academic Treshnikov, which is currently on its way to Antarctica. The DX clusters report showing activity on FT8 and single sideband on 30, 12 and 10 meters. Elizabeth Betty Oakberg, N4LZL of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, recently received the ARRL Centurion Award. Now 102, Oakberg started in radio as a shortwave listener and earned her novice class license in the late 1970s when she neared retirement as an elementary school teacher. She subsequently upgraded to her amateur extra class license. During her more active hamming years, she earned worked all states, made the DXCC honor roll, received the Austrian OE100 award, and contacted the Mir Space Station, among other achievements. A longtime member of the Oak Ridge Amateur Radio Club, she served as an officer for several years and regularly participated in ARRL Field Day. She was also a frequent check-in with the American Foreign Service Net. Oakberg received the ARRL Centurion Award plaque in November, and once pandemic restrictions ease, a formal presentation will be arranged. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. Foundations of Amateur Radio Over the past nine and a half years, I've been hosting a weekly radio net for new and returning amateurs. Called F Troop, it runs every Saturday morning at 0 UTC for an hour. Feel free to join in. The website is at ftroop.vk6flab.com. In making the better part of 6,000 contacts during that time, I've learned a few things about how nets work and how there are built-in assumptions about how a contact is made. There are several things that seem universally accepted that are not actually supported by the evidence, and repeating them to new amateurs is unhelpful. For example, there's an assumption that on 2 meters there is signal reciprocity. By that I mean what you hear is what the other party hears. On HF, contrary to popular belief, this is also not universally true due to massive power and antenna differences, and signal reports on FT8 bear that out. For example, my signal is often reported at least 9 dB weaker than the other station. The reason that on 2 meters this isn't the case is because in general there is at least one other transmitter involved, the repeater. If you're joining in via a remote network, either via RF or via the internet, there are even more times when this isn't true. But let's stay with a simple scenario of a single repeater and two stations. 
If I'm using a base station with a fixed antenna, my connection to the repeater is rock solid. If you are using a handheld and you're on the move, your connection to the repeater is anyone's guess. It could be great, it could be poor, or even non-existent. Not only that, the repeater is often using higher power, sometimes much higher. On average, the repeaters near me are using 30 watts. The highest uses four times that. The lowest uses 10 watts. In contrast, a handheld uses at most 5 watts, but more likely than not, half that. Receiving a strong signal on a handheld is simple. Transmitting a weak signal to a repeater is not. The point is, you might be hearing me as if I'm sitting next to you, but I might be hearing you on the other end of a really scratchy and poor intermittent and interrupted link. If you add other repeaters and links with differing volume or gain settings to the mix, you get the idea that a 2 meter conversation may in many ways act like a HF contact. That implies that there are plenty of times when you should use phonetics to spell your call sign and anything else of interest, despite the often repeated assertion that you don't use phonetics on 2 meters. Another assumption is that 2 meters is less formal than HF. The people you talk to on 2 meters are likely to be local, perhaps people you've met at a ham fest, face to face. You recognize their voice, you know their situation, their station, and their habits. On HF, however, you have contact with people across the globe, most of whom you've never met, will never meet, have no idea about, let alone have a relationship with. That's not to say that you cannot have a friend on HF. I have plenty of people whom I speak with on HF, often during a contest, whom I've never met, but whom I speak with regularly on air. I can similarly recognize their voice, their call sign, and know what to expect. The point is that the more you look at the differences between 2 meters and HF, the more you realize that they are the same. Interestingly, as an aside, a contact on 10 meters or 15 meters can on plenty of occasions sound like a strong local FM contact. My advice is not to think of 2 meters as a, quote, special, quote, band, but to think of it as an amateur band with a set of conditions. By law, you're required to announce your call sign every 10 minutes, and at the beginning and the end of each contact. Note that this doesn't mean at the beginning and end of each over. In case that doesn't make sense to you, a contact is the whole conversation from start to end. Each time a station transmits during that contact is an over. You should vary how you identify yourself, using phonetics or not, at the minimum required interval or on every over, depending on the circumstances, not depending on the band. Look forward to making contact with you on whatever band. You can get in touch via email. CQ at VK6FLAB.com is my address. And if you're into Morse, this podcast is also available as a Morse code audio file. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Over the months, I've received a few requests for this topics. So in answer to these requests, here's Greg's short topics list, volume number one. First, RF exposure. Depending upon whom you ask, the jury is still out on this topic. There are laws which govern exposure in the workplace which may be located on a tower if you're being paid to climb. Certain lockout devices are required by local, state, or federal law to prevent antennas on a tower from being used while you are climbing. If you're climbing on your own tower or someone else's, there may be antennas on the air while you are climbing near them. You have to make up your own mind regarding what you are willing to risk. If you want my opinion, you should avoid exposure to strong RF fields. I will not climb a commercial tower while any broadcast transmitters are active on them. Paging transmitters can pack a healthy wallop, but often do not run all the time. Since the problem with RF is twofold, both exposure and contact, you should attempt to get all active systems on the tower shut down before climbing. If the tower is very tall and you will be separated vertically by a comfortable distance and not climb past any active antennas, you may choose to leave the stuff on at, say, 400 feet if you're only climbing to 200 feet. In my opinion, this rule does not apply to broadcast transmitters. Contact with a metal antenna transmitting a signal as low as 2 watts can produce an RF burn. I know I've gotten them myself, and much to my surprise. 
If you have any other health problems, RF exposure may be of special interest to you. One example would be a climber with a cardiac pacemaker. Secondly, sudden weather changes can be an unpleasant event for any climber. This has happened to me a few times, usually in the form of sudden wind changes. In some areas of the world, the weather can change suddenly due to limited visibility and can creep up without any visible signs. In the case of lightning, the answer is simple. Get down and get away from the tower as quickly as possible. Depending upon how you were dressed, rain may or may not present a big safety problem. For me personally, rain is more a matter of comfort. But if your gear is not suitable for the rain, when it shows its ugly face, it's time for you to exit the tower site. Rain does make surfaces slick, but the proper gear can minimize the problem. You do not want to let your clothing become drenched while installing a 40-pound antenna at 250 feet. So keep an eye on the forecast before starting any antenna job and bring rain gear if needed. I'd rather climb in the snow than rain. If your clothes become drenched while climbing in the rain, this can add lots of additional weight which can also jeopardize your safety. Wind is another story. On a guide tower, wind is not a big a problem as on a self-supporting tower. When a freestanding tower sways in the wind, it causes a weird sensation in the climber's head, similar to the feeling of being suddenly lightheaded. Since you are away from all visual cues of movement on a tower, the, the sway is only felt in the climber's inner ear and in the neck. If you are on a commercial tower, wind may not present an immediate safety problem. This is not the case on a light-duty TV antenna tower in someone's yard. In this case, I always abandon the job and wait for the wind to stop like maybe that night. On a commercial tower, if you're not moving a long antenna, the wind is more of a hassle than enemy. If you're moving antennas in the wind on a large tower, you'll have to decide for yourself if you can safely handle the antenna. The only way I know to safely exit a tower is to have first installed a rope and anchor and rappel off of it. If you feel you may need a fast way to get down off a tower, installing a rappelling rope is the first task after you get to the work site of the tower. Rappelling is considered to be one of the most dangerous forms of rope work since you are totally dependent upon the rope. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. You can email me about this subject at kf9mp at twiar.org. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. You're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio on Finer Repeater Systems Nationwide. Iceland's IRA received a positive response from the Post and Telecom Administration December 4th to their request for renewal of the authorization to use 1850 to 1900 kilohertz in international contests in 2021. A translation of the IRA post reads, The authorization covers the following competitions. The CQ Worldwide 160-meter competition on CW. The ARRL International DX competition on CW. The CQ Worldwide 160-meter competition on SSB. ARRL International DX competition on SSB. The CQ Worldwide WPX Competition on SSB. The CQ Worldwide WPX Competition on CW. The IARU HF World Championship on CW and SSB. The CW Worldwide DX Competition on SSB. The CQ Worldwide DX Competition on CW. And the ARRL 160 meter Competition on CW. The authorization is granted with the full consent of the Maritime Watch Center, which has priority for the use of frequencies during this frequency range. This use is subject to the same requirements as apply to the frequency range 1810 to 1850 kilohertz in a regulation, but the Post and Telecom Administration's increased conditions are as follows. A. The authorization is only granted during the specified international competitions, and B. G licensees are authorized to use full power up to 1 kilowatt. N licensees enjoy the same frequency rights, but the power limit is based on a maximum of 10 watts. In other news, 
Iceland's IRA received a positive response from the Post and Telecom Administration on December 7th to their request for renewal of the authorization for the use of the 70.000 to 70.250 MHz frequency band. A translation of the IRA post reads, The pilot license has now been renewed for the next two years to December 31st, 2022. As before, the following conditions apply. Maximum bandwidth is 16 kHz, no molding conditions. The maximum radiated power is 100 watts. The authorization is subject to the interruption of other electronic communications activities. Transmissions must be stopped immediately and call signs must be used at the beginning and end of the electronic communications connection and at appropriate regular intervals during the electronic communications connection. Licensees must apply for authorization to the PTA before transmissions begin in the frequency range. It shall be specified that an application is made for authorization for a new period, January 1, 2021 to December 31, 2022. And finally this week, in just a few days, the 12-day countdown to Christmas begins. And so does a popular holiday special event. If Sally Rosado, K2RYD, is feeling a little bit like Mrs. Santa Claus right now, there's good reason. For weeks now, she's been getting wish lists from hams everywhere, and it seems they're all asking for the same present. Another chance to work the operators in the annual 12 Days of Christmas special event. Well, that wish has been granted. The third annual special event begins on December 14th at 0 UTC and runs until Christmas Day at 2359 UTC. Operators from the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club on Long Island will be back on the air, as will operators from Michigan, Arizona, and Virginia. As you've all been good little OMs and YLs, you're getting an extra special present. Some of the operators will be calling QRZ with two call signs, so you can grab your French hens and your turtle doves at the same time and qualify more easily for that clean sweep certificate. Be listening on 10 through 160 meters on SSB and CW. There will also be satellite operations. The party, however, doesn't end there. On Christmas Day, get back on the air and work K2B, the Christmas birthday special event, and celebrate with three amateur radio operators who will be a year older on December 25th. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system, on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates, Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates, Incorporated. All rights reserved.